he promised aforetime through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who according to the flesh, David's Son, according to the Spirit of holiness, the Son of God designated by the resurrection from the dead. Paul makes it clear in Galatians 3, verse 8, that the prophets, the Scriptures, the prophets, spoke of the Gospel beforehand unto Abraham, knowing that all that God had promised He would fulfill. In Hebrews chapter 3, the discussion is about God's Old Testament church called out to be His chosen people. To them, the Hebrew writer says, chapter 4, 1 and 2, 2 in particular, to them, he said, of them, he said, for the gospel was preached also unto us, even as unto them. What was brought to them was not legalism, was not some kind of law structure that was interested only in ceremony and trying to win your way into God's favor. None of that is true about the Old Testament. Not a bit of it. To us, the gospel was preached also, also, as unto them. The problem lay, he goes on to say, is that the hearing was not mixed with faith. So that what God called for in His ancient Old Testament church was a response to His grace, a response to His gospel, which was the response He calls from you and me today. Faith. There has never been anything else biblically But the good news about God to the Thessalonians, a church that's begun only 20 years after the Master went back to heaven, Paul twice in chapter 2 speaks of the gospel of God. In the Greek Old Testament, repeatedly we hear the word, the glad Tidings, the Greek word for our gospel. It's all about good news. And as I listened to how you sang as the people of God, apparently you believe it is good news. And you believe it is occasion for rejoicing. And then God bless the church of God throughout the world, that it might let the joy of God be our strength. A God worth talking about. Mm-hmm. Paul in First Corinthians 8, There may be many gods talked about, many lords talked about, but to us, there is one. That's not recent news. That's the profound news right from the beginning. Shema Israel, Adonai Elechanu Echad Adonai. There is one God, and He is Lord. In Isaiah 42, verse 8, declaring His own sovereignty, He said, I am Yahweh. That is my name. 
And I will not give my glory to shaped, carved idols. In the book of Ezekiel, 78 times in the simple verbal form, 78 times, three times for every two chapters, he says this, that you might know that I am Yahweh. Seventy-eight times in sections on judgment, in sections on blessing, to Israel, his own chosen people, and to the foreign nations to whom he addresses himself. Seventy-eight times that you might know that I am Yahweh. Moses, who didn't want the job, didn't want the job for numerous reasons. There's no doubt about it. He's sulking. He thought they would know he was the leader that God was going to use to deliver them. They wouldn't have it. He kills in defense of his own people. His own people, in that expression, says, who made you judge over us? He flees to Midian. His child, the firstborn boy, is Gershom. And he will not circumcise him. Hmm. I'm skipping a lot. You fill it in, all right? He will not circumcise the boy. And God sends him to Egypt to do the job and tell Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn, my son. Turn him loose that he might go and worship me in the wilderness. And he said, if you don't, I'll slay your firstborn. Moses by this time had gotten the message. For on their way to Egypt, God attacked Gershom, who was not yet circumcised. Moses was not giving his boy, his firstborn, to God, but he was going to carry the message to Pharaoh. Give me my firstborn. So God attacks the child and Zipporah circumcises the boy and God lets him live. And Moses learned his lesson. But he didn't want the job. And all the excuses he makes have their soil in his petulance. Finally, he said, if I go to Israel, they will ask me, Who is then the God of our fathers? What's his name? Who will I say sent me? Well, some people called their God Osiris. Some said Isis. Some said Molech. Some said this. Some said the other. Give me a name. And God said, as you know very well, I am who I am. Who knows how it's to be rendered? They're still arguing. I am who I will be. Or, I will be who I am. Or, I will be who I will be. Some say the verbal issue is long gone and God's refusing a name. Moses wants to box him in. I don't mean in a sinister way. But he wants a name that he could be boxed in. And God said, here's my name. I'll be who I show myself to be. And when I'm done, you'll know who I am. And we, we who 
have come to love him. We who have come to hunger for him. We who have come to search for him. We don't know him either. And so we gather this way and we sing one to another truths that we are somehow grasping, some of it anyway. And we look at one another and we tell one another, here's who he is. And that's what we do. For we will continue to do this until that day when we meet him face to face and then we will give up and we will know he's much too much. We can't get to the bottom of him. And he himself will insist on it. Moses to God, show me your glory if I'm your friend. God to Moses, all right. I will make my goodness pass by you. I'll put you in a little fissure in the rock. You will see me, the versions render at the back part of me, and it almost certainly means you'll see me walking away from you. You will not see my face. There's only so much we can know about him. So what I'm about to do is take a couple of bits and pieces that you already know, and which I've been given the privilege here of saying it five times. I'm given the opportunity to speak five times and say the same thing. And that's what I'll be doing. God is sovereign. God is Lord of creation. The Christ himself enjoyed when the message came in that the gospel was going on, looked up and called his father the Lord of heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. So we got it straight from the Lord's mouth that God is the creator. Is he big? You know, they tell us, I don't know if it's true or not, I'm not prepared to argue, nor am I competent. They say that the observable universe, in principle, not in fact, but in principle, with their math, they say the observable universe is 91 billion light years in diameter. So what? 100, what is it, 168,000 miles a second? Multiplied by 60 gives you how far light travels in a minute. Multiply that by 60, how far light travels in an hour. Multiply it by 24, multiply it by 365, and what have we got? One light year. Multiply it by 91 billion. But now they assure us that the not yet observed universe is 100 sextillion light years in diameter. And because the Big Bang is still what's held, the universe is still expanding. So by the time they change the lens on some kind of telescope of some kind somewhere, It'll be bigger than that again. This you believe. This you sing, even if you can't grasp it. This, our song, even if we can't get up our arms around it, is this. That if we got right out to the edge of the universe at present, which is still expanding a little under the speed of light and accelerating out there where there's nothing but neutral, pure hydrogen. You'd find Jesus Christ like a surfer surfing the edge of it as it flies out, looking back and saying, yes, this is my place. If we came across a world with all the fantastic shapes, if we came across a world where the cliffs 
were made of ivory, where all the stars above it were actually huge diamonds, where the rivers and the oceans were made of honey or whatever. We came across a world like that. Up on one of the walls, there would be a sign saying, this is God's place. This is God without limit. And when, when Julian in the mid Middle Ages saw this vision, she said she had of God, this colossal figure, all glory, in his hand was a tiny walnut-sized thing. And she said, what is that? And he said, all created things. A little walnut. God doesn't boast about making all that. It's a nothing to him. You know, they tell us now that they have just recently discovered 300 sextillion more stars. And what do we say? Now we have 300 sextillion more stars blazing out the glory of God. I saw a butterfly once going from flower to flower beautiful thing. I said, what are you doing? And in a tiny little voice, it said, I'm glorifying God who made me. But in a day or two, it would be gone. I heard a nightingale once. It was in the early evening. And it was warbling away, enjoying itself, up on a branch. And I said, what are you doing? And he sang, or she did, I'm glorifying God who made me. In a month or two, it would be gone also. One evening in... Bangkok, I saw the sun setting. It filled a third of the sky, big, red, orange, but soft, not hard. And as it was sinking, the sky behind was becoming dark, soft, velvety black. And I shouted up, what are you doing? And he came within about a hundred yards of me and beamed all out. And I could almost hear the nuclear fission going on underneath, but all soft and just spoke out softly, but from everywhere. I'm glorifying God who made me. And then he went down and the evening was soft and dark. And I heard myself asking no one really. But the wise men say in a billion years or so he'll be gone. Who will glorify God forever? And I'm sure I heard a voice say from Ephesians 3, Glory to God in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Worlds without end. That's your business. My business. To glorify God forever. Worlds without end. You know that's a privilege. You do know. You you do. I don't mean you think it's a privilege. You know this is a privilege. One day when this whole story comes to its, not its end, but its glorious fulfillment, then you will know what a privilege it has been for you. God is not only Lord and majestic in reference to creation. Nations 
He controls. When I say the word control, we need to look for a good model. That needs developed. Uh, Never mind that. But we need a good model when we say God controls the world. And he does. God controls the nations. I look out the window, and uh, well, not this particular window, but I look out the window when I'm in some big city, and people are hiving. Just, I mean, everywhere they go, they're like ants on this huge ant hill. Um, You take a train beginning at France and going all the way across Europe, and cities here, there, and everywhere. Big cities, the kind you know that I don't know. Um, filled with people and, and, and warlords and, and, and administrators and presidents and prime ministers and, and the conflict of nations, all of it going on and you think it's way too big. And it certainly is for us. But He, He who created us all, says what? The nations Put your wine, not the wine skin, the water skin. Put your water skin in the well, pull it out, and the water drops that fall off it. That to me, the nations. For God controls the nations. And although we can't always work it out, and we sometimes look up as Jeremiah and just about everybody else looked up and said, what is going on? On, nevertheless, we trust Him. For we have come to know Him, and hopefully, if you can stomach any more of this, I'll say something about it tomorrow. We have come to know God, not simply through the heavens declaring the glory of God and the sky showing His handiwork, when He really wanted to show Himself to us, He made people. And Jesus said, you want to know what God is like? Ask a father. If your child asked for bread, what would you give him? A stone? If he asked for a fish, what would you give him? An eel? A serpent? No. If you then know how to good, if you being sinners, know yet how to give your children lovely things, how much more. Every mother you see who loves her child, every father you see who loves his family and provides, God says, take a look. She's reflecting me. He reflects me. They reflect me. So in the the creation, he came close. In people, he comes closer. And in the one that you adore... And admire as well as adore. In the one you hunger to serve, he has come closest to us. For he who is sovereign is a lover of the human family. Hmm. Karl Barth says, I find this so wondrous. Am I not a wonderful man for finding that wonderful? No, no, you you do too. She says, do you know why we humans have a relationship with God? For God did not will to be God without us. Can you believe that? Can you believe that God did not want to be God without us? Hmm. When God made us, He didn't say or think to Himself, I want one of those. He didn't even say, I want to be with one of those. He said, I want to be one of those. And what did he do? He became one of us. And he remains one of us. The Lord God who is sovereign, who has power 
all the power we can imagine and more, is a lover of humans. He doesn't just love us in that religious agape sense, which we've turned into something too religious. He not only loves us, he likes us. When he came here, born of the Virgin Mary, he hung around us. He wanted to be with us. He hung around those of us who made a mess of things. And we've all done it, but some of us have done it worse than others, though we're all in need of him. We didn't all go into the pig pen, but we were all in need of him. And it's marvelous to come across people who've come from the pig pen. It's also marvelous to meet some who never got that deep by the grace of God, but who nevertheless need him and need the forgiveness that he offers. The the, the truth about God is staggering. And when he teaches us in Philippians 2... Five and following. He teaches us about himself. He doesn't teach us about himself after the incarnation. End of story. He teaches us about himself prior to the incarnation. What is it that God thought about his own deity? How did he view his own godhood. Have this mind, attitude is probably better, have this mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not think that being equal with God was something to be exploited but emptied himself and took upon him the form of a servant. He was found in fashion as a man and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him. Why is it that we have the incarnate Lord? Hmm. Did the incarnation make God nice and good and and caring? Is, Is that what happened? He didn't really care for us? And then when He became incarnate, He came to like us? Never. Never. He knew who He was. Was happy. God has no identity crisis. He loves to be who He is. He cannot but admire the greatest He knows. And He is the greatest He knows. God loves being God. But God's healthy love of Himself doesn't mean He goes around in the land of the Trinity with a mirror looking at Himself and thinking, Oh, I look good. That in God. No. He's not like a vain man or a vain woman. God loves being God. But there is something in God. There's something about God. Yes, the God we worship. There's something about Him that wants to be with us. And more... God has taken into His own divine experience the actual experience of being human. I don't know who we are, nor do you, nor does any of the philosophers or the theologians. The one who knows who we are is the one who made us in His image. And In the land of the Trinity, when the Godhead chose and purposed to create us, they intended, God the Father and the Son and the Spirit, that united love and unity and joy that they had, they wanted to share it. Not 
to fill up a lack that was in them. Putting the best face on this, the boy sees the girl. He really thinks she is, she's healthy, you know what I mean? <laughs> she's not just healthy, she's a sweet girl. And she thinks he's the bee's knees. She thinks he's wonderful. And people see them. They don't have to look hard. They see them. They care for one another. They start spending more and more time with one another. It gets to be that they would rather spend time alone than with others. It's not rudeness or anything. They just... Hmm. And if he's not there, if he's not there, the day isn't the same for her. And if she's not there, it's just a poor sort of a day for him. Nobody's surprised that by and by when they finish school or whatever that should mean, um, they marry and they adore one another. They help one another grow. They're all the lovely things that we want to be in our better moments. And because they love one another, because of the joy that they have in one another's company, they decide to have a baby. Not to fill up a lack in their marriage. Not to make something better that was going astray in their relationship. No. Out of the joy that is theirs. They want to share it with someone else. And they share it with a a baby and maybe others. And here is a great analogy, metaphor if you must. Here is God saying, when you see this in two lovely humans, you're getting an illustration of, it's it's weak and lacking and limited and all of that, but it points you in the direction you should think this, this, This is the same God who took stars and flung them out into the sky the way we throw rice at a wedding and calls them all by name. This same God is the one who looks at men and women like you, boys and girls like you, and I don't care who they are or where they're living, and loves them and offers them joy. Offers them purpose. Offers offers them destiny. Offers them mission. And offers them the profound and wonderful privilege to worship God and enjoy Him forever. This is He. This is who it is you sing. This is who it is you pray. This is who it is you read. This is who we preach. This is our God. Because He's powerful and because He's faithful and loving, He will fulfill His everlasting purpose. There are some who are not going to get there. The spookiest thing I know about God is you can beat Him. He can say yes and we can say no. And we lose. But so does He. Do I have any pleasure, He would say, in the death of the wicked? Would I not rather that they turn from that and turn to Me? Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, he said, and be saved. And Psalm 17, two verses, that's all. Psalm 117, two verses. Where a Jew, by the Spirit of God, speaks to the Gentiles and says to the Gentiles, Praise him, all you Nations, for God is merciful unto us. 
The message of God is not just for the Old Testament church when it was the elect of God. Nor is it for the New Testament church by itself. We are called out from all the people of the world that he loves. We have a peculiar relationship with him. And our business is to be a community of witness that God has not abandoned the human family, nor does he intend to. And that means that because he loves all of us, Acts 14, God permitted all the nations to wander in their own way, yet he left himself not without witness, in that he gave them sunshine, rain, fruitful seasons, filling their hearts with gladness. And then in 17, God made of one all the nations, He gave them the bounds of their habitations. And He has given unto them not just life and breath, says Paul. He has given unto them everything else. And why? That they might uh, seek after me, He said. And maybe find me. For I'm not far from anyone. And then Paul says, one of your own prophets said... We're all God's offspring. And since that's true, certain things follow. God loves all His children. You sang a while ago, John 3.16. For God so loved the big, round, teeming planet in every generation. And then in 17, He said, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. Why? Why not? Because we did that perfectly all by ourselves. And here He comes and we are throwing ourselves over, all of us, our human family, our our, our brothers and sisters in creation, jumping over into the abyss And he comes saying to us, what are you doing? And we who are self-destructing are saying, we're we're going to hell. And he says, why would you do that? And we've said, because we're sinners and God says we should go to hell. And he says, but I am God. I'm saying you don't have to go. And we say, we don't have to go. He says, no. And we say, well, we're not going then. And he says, good. (laughs) Will you stand beside me and tell everybody else they don't have to go either? This, this is God. This is the God who has come to us in and as Jesus Christ. And this is the God who in Jesus Christ indwells His people and goes throughout the world in each generation, rehearsing in your songs, in your suffering, in your obedience, and even in spite of your disobedience. This is the God who has come to us and in the Lord Jesus Christ, by His Spirit, indwells the church of the Lord throughout the world for the world's benefit. We don't sing for ourselves. End of story. We sing for them. We sing about a God who cares for them. We don't ask blessings simply for ourselves. We do. But we don't ask them simply for ourselves. We ask for the world. Are we so selfish? I know it's not true. Are we so selfish that we want them to love only us and no one else? If it were so, if God loved only us little group and cared for no one else, we couldn't admire Him. And He assures us, I care and I will bring to a conclusion and a completion the overarching purpose. I'm nearly done. It's five past nine. You probably thought it was 11 o'clock. 
No, it's five past nine, and I'm nearly done. I'm nearly done. And God, God bless you for being here. God enrich you. Fill you with joy at understanding Him. Calling on those who teach you. Talk to us about God. Talk to us about God's character and God's purpose. Talk to us about God as He has shown Himself in Jesus Christ. Talk to us about what He means for the whole big, round human family. Talk to us about that. Help us to know Him better so that when we sing, you are beautiful beyond description. We will know why we're saying that. You're awesome. Why is He awesome? Insist that the teachers teach us. Insist that our speakers speak to us about God so that when we sing, He's awesome. We'll know what we're singing. And so that we'll sing the same songs repeatedly. But as the days and the weeks and the months and the years go by, they won't be the same songs at all. They'll be, we will know better. We will sing with more passion. We will understand and with more feeling and more understanding and comprehension. We must, we, we, the people of God, we must come to know Him, of whom Jesus says to know you is life everlasting. We must insist on His adequacy. He's all-powerful. We don't need a hand-wringing God who wishes He could do something about something. No. He sent Moses, let my people go. Yahweh says. Pharaoh says, who is Yahweh? I don't know him. And Moses signed him up for a ten-lesson correspondence course, you remember. (laughs) And when God was done, Pharaoh knew. But Pharaoh said, no. And God said, but I say, yes. And they got to the Red Sea, and the Red Sea said, no. And God ripped its jaws open and yelled down its throat, I say yes. And they come up out of the Red Sea and look at that brooding, sulking wilderness. And the wilderness said, No, I'll starve you to death. And I'll kill you with thirst. No. And God said, Yes. And he spread a table, said a psalmist. In the wilderness, everywhere they went, He smote rocks, and out came the water. He made it a veritable garden for them. There isn't any point in the world and the powers arguing with God. He'll get it done. And one day, they took our Christ, who we're not to pity. Our Master is not to be pitied. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. But they took Him one day. And did what they wanted to him. And were sure that that was him finished. Romans and Jews, Jew and Gentile, we the human family, in those historical people, we put him up there and thought, that's the end of that. Paul in Colossians 2 and verse 15 speaks of God and what he has accomplished. He says this, speaking of God, He disarmed the powers, not just talking about the Jewish, religious, and civil and social powers, that, not just talking about Rome, the fourth beast, the most powerful ancient kingdom ever. Talked about them. Talked about the sinister, demonic, satanic, world spirit that energizes all of that that goes on. All of that got together one day. We, as the instruments of all of that, got him together one day and put him up there on the cross. We stripped him of clothing, 
certainly of dignity, stripped him of his rights, stripped him of, apparently, the power that he would have over the people. And Paul in that text says that when they thought they were doing that to Jesus, stripping him, making a spectacle of him, triumphing over him, that in that very act, in that very crucifixion, it was God who was disarming the powers, triumphing over them, making a spectacle of them in and through the cross so that the world powers need to know killing Jesus has been tried before and it doesn't work. For it's through His dying, it's through His self-surrendering that the world... The whole satanic, demonic system that shapes the world. All of that is whipped. And they put him in the grind sometime Friday, Sunday morning. God looked at his big watch and said, It's time. And up came Christ. Good Friday. No, not by Friday. If God's all-powerful and God loves us so, not just His chosen New Testament people, if He loves the whole world, how does it come that such chaos and bedlam and oppression and all of that is going on People who are critics say to us, yes, well, here are the questions. Why all of that? They think they've invented those. We've invented those questions. We were coming up with those questions long before they came along. Jeremiah would say, oh, Lord, I know that you are good to Israel. If I took you to court, you would I'd talk me and you would win. But I have some questions I want to ask you. Moses did it. Abraham did it. Elijah did it. Everybody did it. Even, and I'm not working with the text, but even the Christ had a why in his experience. How does it come? Well, who knows ultimately, huh? The car's on the side of the road. A fellow runs up. The woman inside is all terrified looking. He's yelling at her through the window. He wants the door open. She's all... He smashes the window. Unlocks the car. Drags her right onto the ground. Stabs her in the throat. Stabs her in the side. She has a daughter with her. A little girl. He reaches in, tries to drag the little girl out. Can't get her. She's caught. He amputates one of her limbs, drags her out, puts her on the ground. Is that ugly or what? Well, it really was ugly, but it wasn't bad. It was a wreck. It was a paramedic who was doing what had to be done if life were to go on in all of that. He enjoyed nothing of it. Children of his own that he loves wouldn't do this, doesn't want to do it. The mother, the mother couldn't breathe. He did a tracheal job and then he put something in there because her lung had collapsed. I met a man in Western Canada, a Canada, uh, a, a, a surgeon, at, a plastic surgeon. That's not the right word now, is it? But anyway, he said he had to do precisely that kind of thing. Your story and mine is that there has been a cosmic wreck and that the divine paramedic will do or allow to be done whatever has to be done to bring life. And there's a day coming 
when all the wrongs will be right at. When we baptize someone into the Lord Jesus, what we're seeing rehearsed and hearing rehearsed is the death and the burial, the life, the death, and the burial and resurrection of Christ. And since each one of you who have been baptized into the Christ, you gospeled as you went down and gospeled as you came back up. You spoke in this liturgical act. You spoke of the resurrection of the Lord. And the resurrection of the Lord is the guarantee that all wrongs will be right at. The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now He commands all men everywhere to repent. Inasmuch as He has appointed a day in which He will judge the world in fairness. And He has given assurance by that man, Jesus, of course, and He has given assurance unto everyone that he will do just that by raising him from the dead. You know what your assurance and mine is? That all the wrongs are going to be righted, whatever that means. And it doesn't just mean that the bad guys are going to be dealt with. All the wrongs are going to be righted. All the oppressed who never had a dog's chance. Everyone God is going to deal with as they should be dealt with. We worry about no one. We just proclaim that there is a God who we might critique and criticize and do all of that. He's going to work it all out. And one day we're going to look and discover He never was our enemy. Never meant us any harm. Only meant to do us good. With this story, I'm done. And then I'll leave you alone. Well, maybe I was done before that story, but I'm going to tell the story and then I'm done. In Tuscumbia, Alabama, the little girl was 18 months old and got a fever and uh, uh, became deaf and blind. Uh, Her name was Helen, as you know. Uh, the parents were losing uh, control, lost it early. She was growing up as a little animal now. They couldn't keep her clean. She wouldn't keep herself clean, didn't know to. Uh, just, just imagine it. They couldn't reach the child and concerned that she was going farther and farther away, so they sent for help. And Perkins School sent a girl called Annie Sullivan And Annie Sullivan, uh, I wish I could do it, but I can't. Annie Sullivan could speak uh, with her hands. And so she meets Helen and teaches her the name, though she doesn't know this, teaches her the name of everything, spells it out, doll, water, chair, this, that, and the other. Well, Helen enjoyed it for a while, a stranger. It was good fun for a while, but after a while she got sick of it and took the key, locked Annie Sullivan in her bedroom, and went and hid the key, learned the power of a key. This is the movie version of what actually has happened. And uh, the parents kept interfering with Annie Sullivan's trying to help Helen. And she finally says, Annie Sullivan finally says to the parents, do less for her or do more. And then she pleads with them to let her take Helen to a little summer house right next door and let her have her for months. They wouldn't hear tell of it. They gave her three weeks. They drove Helen out for a ride. They brought her back to the summer house. They went into the house and when they got her in, they closed the door and they left. And Helen is now groping her way around the room. Now she senses something's wrong here. While she's been groping her way around the room, Annie Sullivan had taken the key and locked the only door out. She finally gets to the door, can't get it open, and realizes. She's now in a panic and she turns and faces and knows her nemesis is there reaches out and that's it. And, and so for the next several days, 
It's a brawl. And Solomon won't let her stand or sit, sleep or wake, drink or eat, unless she does everything the way she's told. And everything that she's told to do, it's all spelled out to her. And Helen can spell everything that she's been shown. By the end of three weeks, the parents must have her home. They get her back into the house, and the first thing Helen Keller does, all this in truth, she gets the key, makes sure all the doors are unlocked, puts the key in her mother's pocket, then she sits down at the table, and he puts the napkin on her lap, drops it on the left. Annie picks it up, puts it back on her lap, drops it on the right. And from that moment, it's a war of attrition until finally Helen takes a big jug of water and flings it in Annie's face. Well, Sullivan, she's an Irish girl. Uh, Sullivan gets as mad as a hatter, grabs the jug, grabs the girl, drags her out to the pump, makes her hold it and pumps And every time water gushes out, she spells the word water. Mm. I love this story. So do you. So do you. It's a great story. It's a great story. Pumps the water in. And every time the water gushes out, she spells water. And then the light comes on. She now senses. You mean that? Is this that what you're doing on my hand? Stands for what's coming out of that? And the teacher says, yes. And she makes her do it again. Wants to be sure. She's got it. And the whole world has now changed. She gets on her knees and feels the soil. Pounds the ground. What is it? Tell me the name of it. Bumps into a bush. What's the name of it? Everything. Wants to know everything. Tell me more. Give me more. Make me more. And then she asks, what's my mother's name? What? Who is this that I do that for? It spells like the name mother. She finds her way to her mother. Everybody's weeping like mad. Oh, she loves the whole thing. Air joy busted out everywhere. And then she realizes, I don't know who the nemesis is. Finds her way over to her and says, What's your name? And she spells out, Teacher. Mm. And then Annie, Helen goes to her mother. Mother thinks she wants to be held. She doesn't want to be held. She gets the key out of her mother's pocket. Finds her way back to Annie Sullivan. Puts the key. Puts, puts the key in her hand. And is telling her, no more locked doors. No more anything from me. I want it from you. You have complete power over me. She now knows. Now she knows. Now she knows Annie was never her enemy. Never wanted to narrow her. Never wanted to hurt her. Put her through all of that. Oh, put her through all of that. To enrich her. Make her wise and joy-filled and useful and be able to do wondrous things. Now she knows you were always, even when I thought the worst of you, you were always my friend. Always wanting to do me good. And there's a day coming when you, who are even now sitting here suffering greatly, physically, emotionally, socially, family-wise, economic worries and all the rest of it, and God doesn't seem to be, you know, and why would He put us through or allow us to go through it? And there's a day coming when you will say to him, Oh, I'm so glad you didn't give me what I was wanting. Leave me alone. I now know, as I never knew before, 
You've always loved me and always loved them and always loved us. And I'm glad that you're my Lord. Glad that you've so shaped me. And I just want to live forever saying thank you. And now may the God of peace Himself make you holy all the way through. May your whole body and soul and spirit be preserved blameless until the day of our Lord Jesus. Faithful is He who called you and He will do it.